Greetings, brethren, for on this very momentous occasion. It is the Feast of Trumpets 2021. I didn't originally plan to make any messages or recording audio message in English. However, due to the fact that our brethren in New Zealand and Australia have been subjected to a insane lockdown, yet another lockdown of this kind, and since our brethren in New Zealand will not be able to get together for the feast in their country, I felt my duty, I felt my obligation to step up with at least giving you spiritual support as much as I'm able to, and in this spiritual support is to at least record some hopefully useful messages that can help you rejoice in the feasts of the Lord, regardless of the situation and circumstances in which you find yourself. Now, of course, I realize that this message is universal, so it can be useful and hopefully uh, beneficial to various other people. So having said that, uh, this is the Feast of Trumpets message, and the title of it is Preparation of the Bride for the Return of Christ. Now, in the Bible, brethren, we find prophesied day, the day of the Lord, which culminates with Christ's glorious return. And Christ's return is represented by this day, the Feast of Trumpets. Also, we understand that the Gospel is a message of hope and encouragement that highlights God's love and mercy for everything He has created. Now, of course, it is the entire reconciliatory plan of God for humankind, the plan characterized by his deep love for all his creation, specifically for humankind. Now, think about it. Well, allowing his eternal companion, Jesus Christ, the Word, to come and die unquestionably demonstrated the depth of the love of the Elohim family. Through Christ's death, they defeated the forces of darkness and continued to fulfill the purpose for creation. So as we will read a passage in Joel now, can we make a connection as to how this festival day relates to the gospel at its core? Let's go to the book of Joel, chapter 2, a very famous passage I think that we all know about, the passage that we even have as part of our hymnal. Joel, chapter 2, verse 1, Blow the trumpet in Zion, Sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Like dawn spreading across the mountain, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was of old, nor ever will be in ages to come. Before them fire devours, behind them a flame blazes. Before them the land is like the Garden of Eden, behind them a desert waste, nothing escapes them. Verse 4, they have the appearance of horses, they gallop along like cavalry. With a noise like that of chariots, they leap over the mountain tops, like a crackling fire-consuming stubble, like a mighty army drawn up for battle. At the sight of them nations are in anguish, every face turns pale. They charge like warriors, their scale walls like soldiers, they all march in line, not swerving from their course. They do not jostle each other, each march straight ahead. They plunge through defenses without breaking ranks. They rush upon the city, they run along the wall, they climb into the houses like thieves, they enter through the windows. Verse 10, before them the earth shakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon are darkened, and the stars no longer shine. The Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number, and mighty is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? Well, this is passage from Joel chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. Brethren, all these dreadful events are ahead when Christ returns. The sound, the destruction, the loss of life is inconceivable. There has never been anything like it, Joel says, nor thankfully, for the world's sake will ever be afterward. While we look forward to Christ's return, these are certainly not events that we may really wish for. It is not a pleasant thing to watch and pray that it happens. Yet, as we contemplate these verses, 
we can gain a deeper understanding, brethren, of the gospel and how it relates to God's plan. Do these scriptures reflect the true nature of our Father? Are these scriptures how He desires to be perceived by humankind? Well, certainly not. In Exodus chapter 34, God had given Moses the two tablets of His commandments, while the children of Israel built the golden calf. So Yahweh was going to wipe out Israel, but Moses convinced him otherwise. God relented and did write his commandments again on another set of tables. And Moses then asked God if he could see him. And beginning in verse 4, God describes himself as to how he wished to be perceived. Exodus 34, verse 4, so he, Moses, cut two tables of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up. Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and he took in his hand two tablets of stone. Verse 5, Now the Lord descended in the cloud, and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, so we have, you know, we have just read about the army of God, how immense, how powerful, how dreadful that day is going to be, but this is how God describes himself first to Moses, then to all of us. And he proclaimed to the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Now, brethren, this is the true nature of our God and his gospel. It is how he desires to work with men. Yet we read, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation. Well, our father and his son, yes, have great power and though it is not his nature, he will use that power to punish those who continually reject his love, those that reject his gospel, his good news. Now the events in Joel chapter 2 they come as a result of a world which continually rejects God's gospel. Who he is, the world rejects. What he is, and, ref and the world refuses to repent. And the people in the world, they refuse to see themselves for who they are. Brethren, it is our Father's preference that all humankind repent, and he asks them to do that. Now, after saying who can endure the day in Joel chapter 2 verse 11, Joel writes now this in verse 12, 13 and 14. Joel chapter 2 verse 12, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Well, brethren, Christ will build his kingdom on the foundation of love and humility, on the whole gospel. He will begin to interact with all humankind through his Holy Spirit. The full revelation and intent of his family governance, his laws, his priesthood, his mercy and his compassion will finally be known by everyone and understood by all who choose to listen. However, what Christ will do immediately at his return by destroying what man has created is not necessarily a part of that gospel. And we need to understand that. Again, you know, it is a result of the continual rejection of the gospel by men. God desires to save humankind. However, he must first cleanse the world of Satan's ways and death. And this is what starts at the beginning of this day. He will leave no vestige of man's attempt to seek his own good news, his own happiness, which only ends in death. Now, the horror we read in Joel actually reflects what is to take place at Christ's return because of the rejection of the gospel, brethren. What is associated with this day that reflects the whole-hearted acceptance of the gospel? Well, the fruit of saying, you are right, Lord, you are my savior, and I accept that if the world would only do that, if the world would only do that. Revelation chapter 19, and let's go to verse 1, Revelation chapter 19, 
verse 1 and we will read uh, verse 1, 2 and 3 and then we'll continue verse 6, 7, 8 and 8. Revelation 19, 1. After these things I heard a loud voice of great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia. Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Alleluia. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. Let's go to verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted it uh, to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints." Well, brethren, the strong gospel message conveyed in the Feast of Trumpets is this, is the joining together of Christ and the faithful members of the called out ones, the church. Verse 9, then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. In other words, it is sure, brethren, it's going to happen. The main message of this day, the Feast of Trumpets, brethren, is the marriage of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, to the Church, the Ecclesia, the called out ones. The complete reconciliation of the creation to God is and will be accomplished through this marriage. Everything up to this time is just preparation for what that marriage is to fully accomplish. Now let us review the marriage customs of ancient Israel and those customs at the time of Christ in order to understand more fully the meaning of this marriage and exactly who the bride is. Now in ancient Israel and at the time of Christ, marriage customs had four major parts. The part number one was the marriage contract also known as the marriage covenant. Now when God talks about the covenant he has made with the people, it is that marriage contract. Remember, the Old Testament was actually the covenant, the marriage covenant between God and the people. Now, the second portion of the marriage customs was the betrothal period. The third is the groom's arrival. And the fourth one was the marriage supper that we read about in Revelation. Of course, groom's arrival was to take his bride. And this is all very interesting because you might remember the parable of the ten virgins who were all waiting for the groom to arrive. Now let's go back to the first custom, so the contract. Now the marriage contract. You know, the contract was arranged by both the brides and the groom's parents. Now of course for us in this age, this is strange because we select our own bride or our own groom. But society then, at that time, operated under a totally different basis for marriage, especially in Israel more than anywhere else. Of course, today, you know, most look at the main goals or objectives of marriage as happiness and security. While these were also objectives of marriage in Israel, they were not the main goal. The main purpose of marriage, brethren, we find in Malachi chapter 2, the main purpose of marriage was defined by God who instituted marriage anyway. Malachi chapter 2, it tells us why God instituted marriage. Malachi chapter 2 verse 15. Malachi 2 15. It says, but did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit? Didn't God institute marriage to make a man and a woman one? And why one? And listen to this one. He seeks godly offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. Brethren, God's purpose for the marriage between Christ and the church is exactly the same. To produce godly offspring. Not at the physical level, but of course, at the spiritual level. The marriage of Christ and the church is not primarily about their happiness and security. It is about Christ and his bride bringing the entirety of humankind into a family relationship with the Father through their faithful commitment to one another. 
You see, their marriage is dedicated to the fulfillment of the father's gospel, the good news of man's return to his father to receive salvation. Just as the parents arranged the marriage so that it would have the best possibility of success, success of producing godly offspring, so does our father. So does Christ's father. Christ's bride is specifically chosen by the Father to include those he determines that will be faithful to his Son. We are very familiar with uh, John chapter 6 verse 44. In fact, I think some of us know it even by heart. But now in light of what we are talking about, it helps us understand in John chapter 6 verse 44, when Christ says, No one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So, you know, our, spare, our parents spiritually and Christ's parental relationship to the Father are exactly the same. So the groom's parent and the bride's parent is the one that does the selection. The bride undergoes strenuous scrutiny and teaching to give the marriage the perfect opportunity to produce godly offspring. Only then will the bride enter the covenant of marriage. You see, brethren, God calls the bride the members of the family. Our calling is analogous to the calling and granting of repentance by the Father to be a part of the body and the bride of Christ, arranged by the Father. Now, who is going to marry Christ? Well, the Father determines the calling and the faithfulness, teaching them what faithfulness is. Also, regarding the marriage contract, there is another part of the contract, rather in the dowry. The dowry was given by the parents of the groom to the bride or her parents. The dowry is the earnest uh, or, you know, the, the, the assurance that the contract that is being written up and agreed to is serious and absolutely binding and that the bride and her parents could be assured the result of that contract. In other words, that bride was going to marry the groom. Now, there will be no breaking of that and the dowry was the part that proved that. The groom would not relent and the bride would not be given to another. Now, for the church, the bride, this was accomplished by the death of Jesus Christ, which was the dowry that was paid, the giving of the Holy Spirit. That was, brethren, the dowry the church is given. The Holy Spirit is the earnest of eternal life and the marriage contract with Jesus. Christ is wholly committed and faithful. The bride must be also. That dowry that she is given not only as, not only is uh, she to believe in it will happen, but it is the dowry that she uses herself. Because she never, she never accepts another dowry. Well, having considered that, now let's go to 2 Corinthians 11 and, and verse 2, that this is why Paul states what he states in 2 Corinthians 11 too. Again, brethren, the dowry that, uh, that the bride is given is not only uh, that she to believe that it will happen, the marriage, but it is the dowry that she uses herself. And she never accepts another dowry. Second Corinthians 11 verse 2, Paul writes, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, in other words, a different dowry that you were given, which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. So this is basically now the crux of the matter, brethren. The gospel truth is that we are the bride of Christ. The relationship God desires between us and his son begins and ends with that contract, that first part. The good news is that it is eternally binding for our Father and Jesus Christ. 
That is why he assures that what he starts in us, he will finish. Remember in Philippians, he who began the good work in you will finish it till the day of the Lord's return, which is the Feast of Trumpets, at the final, at the last trumpet. So we are assured that what God started in us, he will finish. And not only him, but he started, of course, with Jesus Christ being the only mediator between us and the Father. So it is their promise, it is their contract, it is their covenant given with the earnest of the Holy Spirit or with the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. So it is absolute, brethren. It is good news. That is the gospel for the bride of Christ. The bride, through faith, must believe that it is given to her, that it is 100% binding, that it absolutely will happen and use that dowry for that purpose and be faithful to that dowry and not to another. Not to the world, not to Satan, but to Jesus Christ and the Father, the parent who arranged it. How marvelous, brethren, to have this precious understanding in this time and age of total confusion, of total religious Babylon and, 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 and total chaos encompassing our world. Now, following the commitment of the marriage contract, the betrothal period was the second part of the marriage custom. The betrothal period began, which normally lasted, the betrothal, uh, the, the betrothal period normally lasted about a year. We would call it engagement. Okay, so the engagement normally lasted about a year. So it is uh, like our engagement period, but there is one difference. There is one important difference. That period, betrothal period, the engagement period, was the time and period in which, uh, in, in which you know, Mary, remember, when she conceived by the Holy Spirit, she was found with child, and Joseph, Joseph was he was thinking of breaking the contract that had already been set up between the parents. Now today, you know, the engagement is mainly to many about the wedding arrangements. They just spend so much time thinking about the wedding arrangements and possibly when they, where they might live after the marriage, after the marriage ceremony. You know, usually from the time you get engaged to the time the actual marriage happens, the couple involves themselves in, what, in that engagement period in getting prepared for the actual wedding ceremony. However, brethren, that was not the case in Israel. That's why I said there was this betrothal period was similar to our engagement time, but with a difference. In a difference. In Israel, it was about the bride purifying herself for the groom and for the purpose their marriage was to fulfill. And this required the bride to remain a faithful virgin until such a time as the groom decided to come for her. You see, their love was to grow, to be based on their total commitment to the purpose of their marriage and to the offspring of that union. So they were both coming in line during that period. The groom could help the bride and give her the vision of what he had in store for their offspring and the reason for their marriage was Malachi chapter 2, verse 14 and 15 that we just read a few minutes ago. You know, the reason for their marriage was, you know, holy offspring, brethren. It is what the engagement period was about. When people date today, then they're not thinking about the offspring, but about their happiness, don't they? Now, we need to think about that. You know, it is all about the rest, those who will come from that union of Christ and his bride. Brethren, this tradition is analogous again to the church and our Father's gospel. In Ephesians chapter 5, we read about the purification of wife learning her role. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25, the Apostle Paul wrote, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might pre present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. For we are members, now verse 30, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. Verse 31, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is, of course, quote from the 
moment when the marriage was instituted by God back in Genesis. In verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. That great mystery is holy offspring. Here it is, brethren, in the New Testament. That great mystery is a holy, is holy offspring, it being the main focus and objective of the marriage. Verse 33, nevertheless, let each one of you, in particular, so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, that betrothal period was for both of them, of course. Now, since we have Christ, he knows and he is teaching the bride what they are going to accomplish when he returns. When they are married, Christ loves his church, and the church deeply respects Christ and longs for the promise to be together forever. Now, brethren, the question is, do we feel that, that, that way now? Do we, brethren? And this is, I guess, the second time that I'm asking this or similar questions, considering all kinds of things that we have been through uh, in this calendar year. Now, do we feel that way? When we gather, when we gather, you know, when we gather together today, wherever you might be, locked down or not, but when we gathered or when you gathered, wherever you are, when you gathered, when we gathered today for this, this service, was it with that longing for this day, for the, this promise, the contract? Well, this is what Christ meant in Mark chapter 2 verse 19. Mark 2 19, and Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old, and the tear is made worse. Well, in this waiting period... In this betrothal period for us, brethren, are we longing for our groom? Or are we taking old garments to the world, forgetting about the dowry we have been given and attaching to it in a different way that doesn't fit into the contract, into the covenant? Because during this betrothal period which we are in, on this day, which represents our whole calling and walking through life, we are to long for Christ, for the groom, for his return. We are to remain faithful to Christ and not allow anything to distract us from completing our purification or get in the way of our purification period. At the end of the betrothal period, about a year from the time of the contract, contract came the third part where the groom comes to claim the bride. Now, ceremonially, how it was done in Israel was that the bridegroom, accompanied with his close friends, went to the house of the bride at midnight, creating a torchlight parade through the streets. Now, you probably understand why Jesus Christ gave us the parable that at midnight there was a cry, here comes the bridegroom, because that was the custom, brethren, in Israel. So the bride would also know in advance approximately when this was going to take place and so she would be ready with her close friends and her maidens would be with her waiting for the grooms to arrive. <coughs> and once the groom arrived, what then happened? Well, once the groom arrived, the maids and the bride-to-be would join that parade and they would march back to the streets with the torches to the groom's home or wherever the groom was taking her to live. Now this Israelite tradition is analogous to the time which we are celebrating today, brethren. We are celebrating today Christ's coming. And this is the fourth festival. It is right in the middle. We have there are seven feasts of God and this is one is the fourth one. This one is in the middle one which should remind us that it is a pivotal event in humankind's history. The most important event in our history of all humankind is the return of Jesus Christ. And of course, Him, His return, He is also the center of all the Old Testament prophecies, New Testament prophecies. He is also the center, we might say, of the Bible, the center of God's plan of salvation. He has the central role in all of that. And we are to be longing for the groom to come 
so that we can be joined with Him forever. And as a result of that holy union, there will be holy offspring numbering in billions, brethren. How wonderful to know this truth. Now we know that Christ will come for us, for His bride, and take us to become one with Him, joining Him eternally in the spiritual family, as well as to be joined with the Father. Now the exact time we don't know, but we have an approximate idea. We are told if we watch, we will know. But we are assured that He will come. Just as binding as that contract is for the marriage, that is how assured we can be that He will return. And we must be ready and purified. We must be ready and purified. We are familiar with the parable of the ten virgins. I already mentioned that. But let us review that parable in light of what we are reading. I gave a short message in English several years ago when Dr. Thiel was and his family were visiting us in Serbia. He asked me to deliver a, a sermonette, and I chose the parable of the ten virgins. And it's never enough, I think it's never enough for us to be reminded of the meaning and the consequences of this parable. Matthew 25, verse 1. So let's review that parable in light of what we are reading. Matthew 25, 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, now remember the ceremony where they approximately leave at midnight and go after the bride and her maidens. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise, this is a good translation by the way, our lamps, it's not our lamps are out, they are going out. But the wise answered saying, No, lest there should be not enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I don't, do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So, brethren, the groom, Christ, is coming once, only once. It is his second coming on this very day. And he expects his bride to be ready. Those that are ready will participate in the culmination of the marriage which is completed with the fourth part, the wedding supper. In Israel, this supper under quotation mark, or you might say the wedding celebration or the wedding ceremony, lasted for seven days. How interesting that the Feast of Tabernacles does last seven days, right? So, brethren, in Israel, this supper lasted for seven days. An example of that is the wedding at Cana in the Galilee, where, when Christ turned the water into wine. And they said, why did you bring out the best wine at the end? <laughs> you know, that, 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 that may sound strange to us, but, brethren, the wedding celebration in Israel went on for days. We may ask why. Well, because family members could have traveled a long distance, and once they were there, they had to be fed, and they had to be happy. And everyone shares. And some would come later, some would leave. So that wedding supper would last for a week or more. And the main purpose of this supper, under quotation mark, was actually, this is also interesting, to reveal to all the friends and family of the groom, who may have traveled those you know great distances, to reveal to them the beauty and splendor of the bride. It was a time for the groom to proudly yet graciously and humbly reveal with whom he was going to accomplish his life's purpose, his reason for living, which is holy offspring. And of course the guests were there to witness it and to praise it. Now in the case of Christ and the Father, 
it will be a time when they reveal to the world who it is they cherish above all and through whom they have decided to extend salvation to the rest of humankind. Let's return to Revelation 19, brethren. Let's read it again now in light of what we have just discussed. Revelation 19, 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunder, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted, it was granted to her, to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the linen, fine linen, is the righteous acts of the saints. Well, this is truly the gospel message for this day of trumpets. Not only for the body of Christ, the bride, but better by extension, for the holy offspring to come, the entire world. Through the relationship of Christ and the bride, our Father will save the rest of humankind. Everything up to that point is preparatory. Through the relationship, Christ will offer the possibility of spiritual rebirth, re-education to those willing to participate, and the bride will nurture the offspring under the godly governance of her husband. How beautiful. What a wonderful and marvelous plan God has for us, brethren, and for the rest of the world, for the rest of humankind. So all humankind, Think about it. All humankind, billions and billions will be taught by them, Christ and the bride, and through them. And truly the gospel, the work of God, will then begin in earnest and en masse, flowing outward from that eternal marriage, adding many sons and daughters to the Elohim family. The groom will have destroyed the entirety of man's world, and ushered his bride into an era where opposition by Satan and the world will no longer exist. The quality and the quantity of the fruit, the holy offspring, will be unbelievably massive. Think about it, brethren. All of us sitting here today are just a very small prelude. But we are in preparation. We are in preparation to a marriage contract made by the Father with Jesus Christ and the bride. Now, do we see ourselves as participants in that? Do we see ourselves as participants in this? Are we longing for it to come? Because this day, the Feast of Trumpets today, the first day of the seventh month, Yom Teruach, the day of the uh, trumpet sound, this day, brethren, is about us and how we should be thinking about it. If we didn't come to services thinking that, we had better go home thinking about that. Revelation chapter 7. Now the context of this chapter immediately precedes the day of the Lord. Up until this time, Revelation had, has dealt with disasters. You know, the first six seals, you know, full of various terrible disasters. Uh, and with the previous two being the great tribulation and the heavenly signs. Now the seventh seal, the representing the day of the Lord, is about to commence. So in Revelation 7 verse 1 we read, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm, uh, granted to harm the sea, the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Now, you see, before our Father signals the beginning of His wrath, the day of the Lord, that last year, He designates an angel to go through the entire world, placing a mark, a seal, that designates them as servants of God. Now, Anyone having this seal will not be recipient, you know, will not be recipients of the wrath of God. They will witness it, but they will not be targeted by it. They will stand there seeing all the things we, re we read in Joel happening. Now the chapter begins to describe two distinct groups within the sermons of God, the ones receiving this mark. The first group is described in verse 4, Revelation 7, 4, and I heard that the number of those who were sealed... 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Now, there are, you know, many differences of opinion as to whether this represents physical Israel or spirit-led Israel being the church. As always, it is, you know, best to allow scripture to interpret itself, whether we, we can understand it or not at this time. In Revelation 14, we find 
the moment that Christ returns to Jerusalem in Revelation 14 and in verse 1, Revelation 14, 1. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. Now the 144,000 here are described as those who will stand with Christ at his coming. So we have parallel to 144,000 with this, uh, you know, uh, with those who will be standing, standing there with the Father. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 speaks about the return of Jesus Christ. And the first Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then he, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So there are people, there are individuals, there is a group that will rise and meet Jesus Christ in the air and then come down with him as we read earlier. So let us return again to Revelation 14 and continue reading in verse 2. Revelation 14, 2. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, women not meaning you know any sexual or marital relationship here, not defiled with women because a woman is a symbol symbol of a church in the Bible. Therefore, we have one woman, you know, which is the true church, and we have women, which means you know many false Christian churches around around the earth, around the world. So these are the ones who are not defiled with those false Christian churches, for they are virgins. In other words, they are doctrinally pure. They've been purified from all the doctrinal errors and now they're ready to marry their bri- their bridegroom. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So from these scriptures, brethren, we can deduce that the 144,000 are those who are the first fruits. Now, are they resurrected? from the dead, or changed at Christ, uh, as Christ descends from heaven. They join him in the air to always be with him, his bride, and then they stand with him in Jerusalem. Now the church, the bride, is the 40, 144,000 resurrected individuals revealed in Revelation 7. Let us return to Revelation 7 again. Let's read uh, in Revelation 7. So the first group is the church, the bride. There is some more description about the 144,000. Revelation 7, 4. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, the 144,000, of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Of the tribe of Judah, and then it mentions Reuben, and then in uh, chapter 6, mentions in verse 6, that is, uh, mentions the tribe of Asher, tribe of Naphtali, the tribe of Manasseh, the tribe of Simeon, the tribe of Issachar, and Levi in, in verse 7. In verse 8, it is the tribe of Zabulon, and uh, the tribe of Joseph, and the tribe of Benjamin. So God defines 12,000 from each of the tribes, except for Dan, who is not in here. Now, why 12,000? Well, 12 times 12,000 is 144,000. So, if this is spirit-led Israel, the church, the bride, we enumerate, you know, uh, well, is this the spirit-led church? Uh, Why enumerate then using physical Israel? Israel after flesh. Well, you see, because God uses the number 12 to represent government, leadership, governance. Just as God desired physical Israel to become the example nation that would eventually grow throughout the whole world, he will have his church, the bride, that he will use as an example to everyone, as the model, and use her to spread his government, his governance style, over the whole world. Now, uh, 144,000, whether it is an exact number, is not the point, really. But its meaning is the point. You see, our Father, brethren, will reestablish His kingdom through the leadership of both Jesus Christ and the Bride, the resurrected ones at His return, the ones that are changed from physical to spiritual. 
that the church, the bride, is the first sealed group. In verse 9 of Revelation 7, we read about the second but distinct group. Verse 9, Revelation 7. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Verse 13. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these? arrayed in white robes and where did they come from and i said to him sir you know so he said to me these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb therefore they are before the throne of god and serve him day and night in his temple and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them they shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more the sun shall not strike them nor any heat for the Lamb, who is in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So this large number of individuals are not part of the 144,000. They are not part of the church. They are not part of the bride. They don't serve that role. Well, these are individuals who go through the great, through the great tribulation. They repent and they wash themselves by enduring righteously and turning to God for their salvation. In Joel, what did he ask them to do after reading the whole thing? Joel asked them to repent. And that is part of the gospel. Now recognize who you are. Repent. You are sinners. Recognize who God is. Repent and follow me. These people did exactly that, brethren. So what does God do? For those people, well, as he said, he as he said, he does. Part part of that gospel is that we have a God who forgives. We have a God who relents. So instead of leaving stubble behind for these people, he gives them life. He protects them. He chooses to spare them from his wrath for the reasons written. In all likelihood, they will be a part. They will be part of the guests at the supper. Now this. That is just a speculation, indeed, it's not a doctrine, it's just a speculation, but, you know, by the way, it reads here, we can conclude that they will be the beginning of the offspring, the holy offspring of God through that marriage of the bride and the 144,000, Ecclesia, the church. Uh, so, the church, being the bride, will marry Jesus Christ. The beginning of an innumerable multitude of those born into the family of God will most likely be the beginning of that holy offspring indeed. And from that time forward, the marriage of the Lamb and the Bride will continue through the millennium, through the white throne judgment, and will give birth to more and more children of God as their marriage teaches repentance and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. You know, upon baptism they will receive the Holy Spirit, which will eventually lead to eternal life. No different than us now, just the timing, brethren, and without Satan and the world in the middle. So one that is, once that is complete, the marriage will last forever, long past the white throne judgment, strengthening and leading all the children of God into whatever our Father decides to do next. We don't know what we do not know what will be next because he does not reveal that to us. But what the book tells us in the end, the book ends indeed with you know leaving us space to think about the future and that eternity, think about that eternity, but the book ends, but we don't. Our father doesn't end. We know that our father is a purposeful creator. And that there will be something following for the entire family. What will be following, we'll see. Brethren, the Feast of Trumpets' main goal, gospel message is our marriage. Our eternal joining to our groom that we long for, the Lamb of God. What we should be doing now is rejoicing in our calling to be a part of that bride.